Greetings, everyone. I'm Dejimon11. I'm Marcos Flores. I'm Sonic Fomi Fan 9805. And I'm the Azure Caper. And today we're going to be interviewing Ken Penders. Introduce yourself, sir. Uh, hello, I'm Ken Penders, and uh, I'm here to talk with these fine gentlemen here. So, <laughs> oh, nice. Fine so, gentlemen? <laughs> <laughs> you are a funny man, my good sir. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm told. The only three of us that are not fine. I'm just one person. But... <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> hey, are you ready, sir? I'm ready. Awesome. All right. All right. Let's go. I'll uh-huh. start off with the first question. Um, first of all, how did you start off your career? How did I start off my career? That's really interesting. I actually started in high school. I uh, approached various companies with samples of my work, offering to do freelance projects for them. And then I ended up uh, getting hired by a company to silk screen designs on t-shirts. And then from there, I... Uh, my parents couldn't afford to send me to college, and my grandmother said, well, the military is paying for college, so why don't you sign up? And that's how I found myself in the Air Force, working as a technical illustrator. And while I was in there, I actually got to attend courses that they paid for, you know, at various colleges, and I went from there, I went to the Art Institute of Boston, and I ended up working at Uh, as a technical illustrator for a civil engineering firm and during that time I actually began submitting samples to various comic book companies and uh, my first work was originally supposed to be seen in the Charlton Bullseye series they were publishing back in the early 80s but Charlton went under so from there I began approaching Marvel and DC and um, They accepted my samples, and my first work was uh, for DC Comics, Who's Who and Star Trek. And an independent publisher got the rights to do Man from U.N.C.L.E., so I began penciling and inking uh, the first four issues of that story. And from there, I would just keep accumulating assignments and getting more work and getting to know more people at both Marvel and DC. And and eventually... uh, Because of those friends, I was able to submit work to Archie when they were looking for the Sonic series. So, that's interesting. I learned something new today. Yeah, yes, I know. Um, This brings us to my next question: What was your favorite? What was your favorite issue that you wrote? Favorite issue that I wrote. Um. I would have to say, oh, it's it's, it's a it's a toss up really between um, Sonic Forty Seven and Super Special Two and and Seven um, would have to be right there. It, it, it all depends on how I feel any given day. Um, and of course, there there was one story that I was working on that never did get published, and that was the original uh, Knuckles 20 years later, which eventually morphed into um, the Mobius 25 years later stories. And so right now, I would have to say the Lara Zoo Chronicles is, is currently my favorite storyline at the moment. No, that's good. No fair, we haven't seen it yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I put out the page one on Twitter of the Jeffrey Remington story, and that's going to be the bridging story between where I left things in Sonic 144 and the Lara Sue Chronicles. And oh. I'm, and I'm hoping to have that out by the end of the month, just as I'm getting ready to do Long Beach. So, the comic convention there. Oh, well, we that part. All right. Very nice. But yeah, um, um, next question for me. Um, on the subject of Sonic the Hedgehog, um, the complete series DVD box set of Sonic the Hedgehog, I noticed that you were the one that I illustrated the cover for it. And I was wondering what exactly went about that you were approached to handle that. Did you request to do so, or did someone come to you? How did that work out? 
Um, actually, the people there who um, were working on the DVD box set, they apparently were in contact with Sega, and I was working with the licensing director of Sega at the time. We were trying to get a, a Sonic film project off the ground. So apparently he passed them along my name. Um, they got in touch with me, and the, 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 initially they asked if, the, you know, who you know which sonic artists were available for for that and uh at the time i wasn't sure i could take on the assignment because i was busy with something else so i passed it along to patrick spaziante and he basically didn't have the time to commit so they came back to me and i said yeah okay fine i'll make it work and that's what happened there i see nice Okay, my question. What are your opinions towards the comics as they are now? To be honest, I really don't know that much about the material after I left the book, okay? And for the longest time, I didn't pay attention simply because I knew if I said anything, it would either come across, uh, as some people have said, sour grapes, or that I was trying to kibitz where I wasn't welcome, that sort of thing. And basically, in my head, I had thought I had moved on from the comic book anyway. Um, uh, I was getting involved in a number of projects. I was still involved with Sega trying to get the film project off the ground. Um, and I ended up getting into the animation industry. So I really wasn't focused. And it was only when other people made me aware what was going on in the comics. I think the only things I really checked out was the storyline in issues 181 through 184 because they heavily featured a lot of the echidna characters I created and um, and I think I checked out the couple of there was a couple stories I think in 205 206 that dealt with uh, some of the Dark Legion characters and some of the setup there and I was kind of curious uh, once I was uh, made aware of them I, I should say um, my my approach my my feelings of the comics in general is i wish everybody success i um i hope every you know people enjoy what's going on and you know basically i'm not looking to tear down or or say to the fans you know you uh this version is better than any other version if anything in my approach as far as anything with the book goes is everything everything is canon as far as far as that goes um I, i'm whatever people are happy with really that's my attitude okay that's a good attitude okay um i will start with my second question is um uh who is your biggest influence on your work in, ter in terms of like anybody really on my work, oh wow, um, the biggest influence, bar none, was uh, Jack Kirby, both in terms of his writing, his storytelling, his art. Um, I loved how Jack told a, a, a story in the comics. Uh, I would say Gil Kane and Jim Steranko were other comic book artists that were highly influential when I was growing up. Um, and uh, films uh, films were very influential particularly you know uh, science fiction and, and the James Bond films and the, and the thing that really got me about the Bond films were uh, the graphic elements about them they were when I was exposed to them I was like 12 years old and they were, visually, they were something entirely different from anything else I, I would see as a kid. 
and so that, that really had a, a, an effect on how I approached my storytelling. Hello? Yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah, we're here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, so what influenced you to make the Larisu Chronicles? Um, what influenced me to do the Larisu Chronicles? Well, basically, okay, I was made aware that Sega came out with the game, the, the uh, Sonic Chronicles. Um, and if things had turned out differently, um, I dare say that it would have ended like a lot of uh, settlements have I've seen happen between Marvel and its creators and DC and their creators. And there would have been uh, royalty settlements and, you know, everybody shakes hands and goes on their way. But unfortunately, we got into this big public fight. And when I was talking to my lawyers, you know, basically the question is asked, what do you want? All right. And you have to come up with answers. And one of those answers was, well, um, because when you find yourself in this situation, if nobody wants to negotiate, it becomes an all or nothing situation. You have to, you know, clue people in on what you want to do. And it was at that point that, you know, I gave voice to, well, I got to do something with these characters. What am I going to do with that? And I saw that I had this unfinished story you know, that I left hanging at the end of Sonic 144. And I said, okay, wow, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, I want to, I want to finish that story. And, and the thing is, you know, I knew unless Sega and I were willing to work out something where I could use Sonic and or Knuckles, that those characters were going to be off limits. So I had to figure out some way to work around that. And the most logical choice was Lara Sue because she was the daughter, she was the next generation. And therefore that was my starting point for moving forward with the whole cast of characters and work, working out the scenarios. So that's how that came about. Uh, okay. Nice. Okay, so um, moving on to my next question. Um, on the topic of uh, the Laura Sue Chronicles, you, that's something you're working on. But I also notice a lot of other folks don't uh, realize you also have two other projects on your hands. There's the uh, the Lost Ones film and the Republic miniseries. How are they coming along? If uh, there's anything okay. you can share regarding that. Oh yeah, I can. Um, first off, I'm working with uh, a gentleman know, uh, named James Christopher. You can look him up on IMDb as he has some really impressive uh, uh, sound credentials because that was my main problem is getting the audio tracks uh, done well. Uh, basically, working on a, a film project of any kind uh, two of the most important elements when doing it uh, are the sound and and how the, the the scenes are lit. Okay, I could handle it, everything else, but those two things, you know, I definitely needed specialists for for those. So uh, right now, Jim and I are currently going through every single scene, every single shot. Um, uh, reworking that and eventually we hope sometime later this year to have uh, the first episode available uh, via iTunes or Amazon.com or Netflix when we're, when we're ready to go on that and we're hoping to do uh, further episodes once we get it up there I've spoken with both Sean Young and Mark Singer and they're good to go 
as far as any sequels on that. Um, as a matter of fact, both, both have expressed interest in doing uh, any audio tracks um, as characters for the Laura Sue Chronicles, uh, if oh. I can get that all pu pulled together. So, because uh, I recently had breakfast with Mark and I, and I showed him a drawing of the character I was interested in having him give voice to, and he was all on board, so... So right now it's up to me to get my act together and get everything working. So it's not just a matter of, of writing and drawing the Laura Sue Chronicles. It's also a matter of of planning the app and because we I'd like to have a vocal uh, an audio component to it and um, planning all the elements that I need to bring it all together. And as for the other project, the Lost Ones. Um, my son has uh, come on board to help me with um, actually recutting the uh, trailer for it because we need to have uh, we have a script we have and we need a finished trailer in order to take that. There's a couple of companies that have expressed interest in actually turning that into a full length feature. So, but we have to have everything finished to submit to them before we can go further so everything is, is is very time consuming that's one of the biggest drawbacks is i'm like my own company more or less i don't have the staff that i need to to do everything that needs to be done as quick as possible all right right i'm looking at their resumes right here their filmography i guess yeah there's the right word can they've been awfully busy lately hmm so when do you think that we'll get like a T? Like when, when do you think it's going to come out? Which what what is going to come out? The lost one. The lost ones. I, I I hesitate to give that any any particular date. I mean if if you look at how Hollywood works on their film projects, I mean like here Kingsman: The Secret Service, just to use that as an example, and that's a you know. 100 150 million dollar movie okay it was supposed to come out in october they needed they needed a few extra months they pushed it back to february same thing with like jupiter ascending you know so these are you know studio supported projects with huge huge budgets and you know they can you know they need to push things back in order to accommodate whatever reasons you know the Whatever conditions the film currently is in, that's what happens. And so I'm very hesitant to say anything until I know I'm really close to the finish line as far as the, it goes. I am in this position where I see the work getting done, but you know, putting out news alerts, hey, I just finished this one scene today. That you know, this is not gonna cut it. So I just sort of lay low as far as with the public comments on that until I feel comfortable, you know, we're getting there. Understand. Not right. Right. Yeah. right. Don't want to set a deadline too soon. Exactly. I mean, right now the projects are getting worked on. I see them getting worked on. People I know are seeing the project, everything getting worked on. So, and, and, and again, like with the Lara Sue Chronicles, um, I actually have uh, a person helping me He's doing the coding for the app, you know, he, according to my specifications. And again, um, while we're, I'm working on the graphic novel for the Laura Sue Chronicles, the script and the art, um, I'm also having to work out the designs. And in turn, another individual is turning some of those designs into CGI renders, which they will be part of the package that we submit to get that off on, you know, possible animated or live action project. So there's a lot going on. Hmm. All right. Okay, my next question. Where do you think you excel at the most? Writing or art? Where do I think I excel the most? That that is a very difficult question for me because um, 
basically the act of creating, whether it's a film or a script or the artwork, it's, it's all effort that I never feel comfortable with until I see something completed. So I'm always juggling that question in my head. I, I, I couldn't really answer that one. Okay, that, that's okay. Yeah, fair enough, I'd say. All right. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, I will ask you this question. is um, How were you introduced to uh, the Sonic franchise? The Sonic franchise? A um, friend of mine, Mike Kantorovich, was friends with co-editor Paul Castiglia. And Paul was looking for some submissions because... He, apparently, uh, writer Mike Gallagher told him that he may be departing to go work uh, on stories for Marvel. So Paul started looking around, and he asked Mike, because Mike and his co, his partner, Tom Brevoort, you know, they did a number of uh, stories for uh, Marvel's kid line at the time. And so, uh, because Tom was so associated with Marvel that... You know, I, I think that's why Mike didn't ask him. So Mike called me up. And he said, you know, Paul wants uh, me to submit something for something called uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. And I don't know the first thing about it. And I had just gotten the Sega Genesis. And uh, I had, was also buying uh, the comics for my, my son. He was like five or six at the time. And so I said, hey, I know the character. Why don't you come on over? We'll put together a few story ideas. We'll send them to Paul and see what happens, which is what happened. He came over. We worked out uh, some premises. You know, they were about like one to two paragraphs long. We submitted about three of them. And uh, we waited to hear from Paul. And about day or two later he got back to us and said here uh, we'd like you to take a crack at these stories so so we submitted our first story and the rest is history from there hmm. all right uh for my next question which you kind of answered for one part but i just want to know what was your opinion of the uh, working with the other writers and What's your opinion, current opinion on the future writers? But you already, we already know the answer for that one. I, I don't think people really know. Uh, like, I always respected Carl. I, I, um, you know, Ian's work. I really haven't, you know, read much to to comment. But I, I imagine, given that uh, the following he has and. The book is selling that he's done, you know, a uh, professional job. Uh, you know, Mike Gallagher, again, him and uh, Scott Fulop, who wrote under the pen name uh, Ken Taylor. They were, they were all guys um, I respected. Uh, Mike, my partner Mike, I, I, I had the highest regard for. Uh, the, about the only writer... I, I really didn't think had a feel for the book at all was um, Angelo de Cesare. And, and that may be more because, A, his heart was more into the Archie uh, line of books. And, and uh, B, Mike and I were more attuned to editor Scott Fulop's desire for more uh, adventure stories than than slapstick comedy so you know our heads were in a different direction than angel well so you know I, I don't want this looked at as a knock against angel it's just that's how, that's how we felt okay see oh, very nice and that sort of answered my other question when i was um dadgy pretty much uh 
asked it for me how you felt about the other writers and whatnot so i'll just move on to another one um it's clear that you said um you know you bought your son a sega genesis so you were familiar with uh, sonic before you moved on to the comic but uh this question here is um uh, during your time on that comic was there ever a time where you felt you had to research sonic via his games or cartoons or say you had to do an adaptation of a current game coming out did you have to look into that or did they provide supplemental material for you well here's the thing right from the get-go Mike and I were asking for all sorts of sorts of material for reference uh, when we were working on the stories because you know we were trying trying to get a handle on what exactly both Archie and Sega wanted. For example, okay, you go to Marvel and you're going to work on Spider-Man. You know that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. He shoots freelance photo uh, photographs for the Daily Bugle. Here's his cast of characters. Here's the girls he interacts with. You know, his aunt may get sick. You know, uh, he may have to encounter a villain, you know, that threatens to reveal his secret. There's a whole there's a whole mythology there that's already established. It's the same with Superman. It's the same with Batman. Bruce, you know, Batman is Bruce Wayne. He has to put on his, his uniform with a utility belt, get in the Batmobile, and go fight the Joker. You know, so there's a lot of material there that you know going in, you know, how to set up, you know, to build a story around. With Sonic, um, sure, we got the Sega Genesis, and yes, I was picking up the comic books to my son, which I read with him, but I never really get a grasp of the character other than you know he, he was fast and he had this attitude you know which was on display when you played the game uh, i mean there was no sense of relationships um it wasn't until the cartoons uh came along but even then um you got to keep in mind i was an adult i had i i wasn't focused on sonic per se, because I had other projects in the line. So, you know, following the cartoons, there just wasn't time, you know. So therefore, uh, for example, we would ask, I would ask the editors, could you get hold of any scripts, any reference material from from uh, the animation company for us to, to take a look at? So the only thing Sega handed over were like the game manuals. And... And it wasn't until, like, I'm working on issue 36 or about to do the story for issue 36 that I actually see uh, the first full scripts, just scripts, and other reference material from the Saturday morning series. You know, so uh, it took a while trying to get anything from anybody uh, over at Sega or, or Deke at the time w was like Mission Impossible. So <laughs> we, we, we always felt like we had our hands tied behind our backs, you know, and, and, and Sega never gave us any direction whatsoever. The only thing we found out that they were most concerned about was the visual look of the comic. Really, they, they, they didn't care so much about the stories as they did about the visual look. That's even when I, I met with them years later, when I when I sat down opposite executives from Sega of Japan and the licensing director from Sega of America to discuss making a Sonic movie, okay, I proposed that you know as a starting point that the the comic book series would be the basis from which we would draw the material to make the film from, and they were perfectly agreeable with that. And, but the only thing they kept insisting on is they wanted full approval of what the visuals would, would look like. You know, so, so even there, you know, 10 years later, that, that that's how it was. So. All right. So many new things I keep learning today. Yeah. <laughs> you. I think that's going to be our running thing for today. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, he was from, that, that's the thing is there's a lot of hidden history that a lot of Sonic fans really are not aware of. You know, even what they've seen on the message boards, even what they've seen, you know, posted, you know, 
elsewhere, whether it's been in a news article or, or what have you, it, there's, there's just a lot there that they're so unaware of. Oh, of course, for good reason, I imagine. You know. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, when it comes to the Image crossover, who voted so that Sano would cross over with Image? I know you were working on both. You were working with both at the same time, right? Well, actually, what happened was um, Jim Valentino had gone through a rough patch in his life at that point in time. And he wanted to do something fun. And he had two young, he has two, two, two sons. They, but they, and they were the same age as, as my son. Okay. So he approached Archie, you know, that he wanted to work on the, the Sonic comic. He wanted to submit something to the Sonic comic. All right. And it was really funny because both the editor at the time, Justin Gabri, and the publishers of Archie, they're, they're, they're looking at themselves and saying, the publish, one of the image founders is contacting us to work on the Sonic book. What is this all about? So they didn't know how to handle it, so they gave that assignment to me. And they gave me Jim's contact info, and I contacted Jim, and... Um, he said, look, it, my, my, my boys love Sonic. I want to do something fun. And so we collaborated on that pinup, which was published in Sonic 60. And, you know, Jim liked it so much, he wanted to do something in. So I pitched him, you know, how about a team up? And he just thought it was a, such a wacky idea that he loved it. And we pitched it to Archie and, you know, we made it work from there. So that's how that took off. Oh. Okay. Okay. So many new things going. All right. Uh, well, I'll start off with my uh, other question: Is uh, what is your favorite color? My favorite color. <laughs> I hate to answer that because it generally comes out either black or blue. All right. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first. <laughs> okay. Well. All right, I'm trying to look at another question I can ask. Uh, when you were writing for Sonic, were there any other mandates that Sega gave you? Because the only one that I've heard that you originally wanted to pitch uh, Sonic versus Evil Mario par doc Dentist parodies. Oh, like that. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was one of the first things we we submitted was that uh, we were going to do a Mario take, Sonic meets Mario, but we couldn't do plumbers. We knew that going in, so they were going to be, de him and his brother were going to be dentists and sad. And, and Sega was just absolutely adamant against that, okay? Uh, you know, the funny part is, if I, we had pitched it later, uh, it probably would have gotten done because uh once we once Mike and I got established on the book and we established a, a relationship with editor Scott Fuller, we could we had the time of our lives. We we could do whatever we wanted. We would just pitch stuff and say, look at this is what we want to do. You know, because initially the idea I pitched for Sonic Live was initially turned down. And then a couple of years later, you know, I pitched it again and it, it, and it sailed through. You know, nobody was, by that point, nobody was stopping us, you know, whatever we wanted to do. Um, the only other thing beyond that uh, was when I was doing the Endgame stories that I wanted to kill Sally off at the time. And... That was going to go through up until the last moment when uh, the editor, more so than Sega, got cold feet on that one and said, can we not kill her off? And since by that point um, he had offered me the Knuckles series, I said, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll keep her alive. Was there a reason for that? 
What, the Sally? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was very much a re In my head, there was a, a very strong reason for that. Um, again, this goes towards, you know, uh, Sonic is the main character. Okay, he goes off on an adventure. If, if Sally goes with him, you know, technically, she's in command. He can't do anything unless she gives the order. Okay? You take any other situation, you know, where there's like a chain of command. You know, Captain Kirk, James Bond, you know, the Avengers, whatever. Okay? There may be a, a figure that gives the order. Okay? But... They stay behind, you know, like whether the, the Admiral is in Starfleet or M stays in MI6 in London, you know, and Bond goes off in his mission and he's got full, you know, authority or Kirk has his full authority, you know, with the starship. You know, with Sonic, he takes Sally along on the mission. You know, she is the leader. And, and basically, it was either... She stays behind, which I'm not so well sure how well that would have uh, sat with the female readers uh, that we were discovering, or um, or kill her off, and get, which would also provide Sonic with much more uh, emotional resonance, emotional uh, motivation for what happens next. Because the other thing too that that um, I wasn't happy with as far as the stories is we were dealing with a wartime situation and to me there there had to be I know it's a, a kid's book but even when I was a kid reading uh, war stories and comics okay there was an element of tragedy to some of the best stories in those comics and I thought that was something that would take the Sonic series up to the next level by introducing that element of tragedy. And basically, I didn't think of the of the book at that point as a as, a, as just a kids book. Um, our audience was growing, uh, not just growing in size, but you know, growing up with us. And I was definitely getting the feeling they were searching for something more from the stories as well. So. That was why I was heading in, you know, that approach. Uh, no, I was wondering, like, why they brought, why you had to bring Sally back to life. That, that's why I want to know. Um, like I said, the, the, it was more or less editor Justin Gabri. He felt that if I wasn't going to be sticking with the Sonic book, that, you know, and following, you know, what I was going to do with my plans, um, that I was essentially tying you know, the hands of the writers coming after me. So, uh, he didn't want that to happen. I so. see. Mm -hmm. And to just to backpedal a bit on the Mario parody thing, uh, it's funny, because in the UK comic, Sonic the Comic, they actually oh, do gosh. have a Mario Brothers parody <laughs> that are electricians. You uh, know, this is, uh, whatever anybody brings up the, the UK series to me, you know, I, I have to remind them that, first of all, you know, when we were doing the Sonic comics back then, we weren't even aware of the UK book. Seriously, we were not aware of it. I mean, we never even saw a copy until I think the first issues I saw were a couple of copies that uh, Justin Gabri sent me in the mail. And this was in 2001. OK, so I have no, no clue what they were doing over there. Sega never talked about it. Uh, uh, or brought that up. I mean, to give you um, the level of communication that was going on at, at at the time, you know, like here they were doing the Sonic Underground series. We didn't even know that was going on until it was just about to go on. And then the licensing director at that time for Sega contacts us and says, you know, we'd like you to work this into the series. And when Justin heard what was what was involved and what was in the series would have 
if we had incorporated that, it would have so blown the continuity we had been building up that Justin said, no, we can't do this. You know, so, but he was willing to compromise and say, look at, we can make this an alternate universe story. And I think it was an issue Sonic Super Special 10, I think it was. You know, don't hold me to that one, but I'm pretty sure um, that was the compromise, you know, because they we were not going to uh, mess with the continuity, you know, because Sega didn't give us any time at all to incorporate that. Just like there were elements, for example, in Sonic Adventure um, from that video game, and I think Sonic Adventure 2, uh, where we hit... You know, we were asked to incorporate elements, but the thing is, again, they never provided us with reference. I mean, give you an idea how how, how our hands were tied with Sonic Adventure. Um, artist Patrick Spaziante, all he was able to get his hands on was the Japanese version, and he did some translation from that. That was it. We had nothing else to work from. We were dependent on Patrick's translation. Wow. Oh, my God. Yes. Good heavens. Yeah, so that's what that, those, those are the conditions we worked under, you know. That's why that's why we had we had no choice more often than not than to come up with our own continuity and run with that. Because you you have a monthly comic book, you have deadlines to meet. Okay, and oh yes, yeah, Sega wanted to take a look and see what was going on, even though if they didn't comment on it, you know. That was that, that was it. I see. Yeah. Good heavens. <laughs> okay, well, uh, this will be my final question. Um, regarding Sonic the Hedgehog as a whole, does he still play a role in your life? As in, do you keep up with his recent outings throughout any kind of media? I believe he has a new cartoon out, Sonic Boom, and supposedly the live-action movie will be coming out next year. Like, do you have any idea on that? Does he? Do you still keep up with him in any way? I keep up with the news. I, to, it's not that I even have to go searching for the articles because you have to understand I get questions from people literally all over the globe asking me about anything latest with Sonic. Okay. I have never once ever represented myself, for example, as the creator of either Sonic and or Knuckles. And yet you would be surprised how many people think I am the creator of those characters simply because of my work on the comics. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Seriously. I, I, I never, I've never made that claim. I am constantly having to correct people on that. So it's, it's not like I have to go searching out for anything Sonic. I mean, when I die, you know, I, I, I expect that my obituary is, first line is going to mention Sonic or the lawsuit or what have you, but that's that's it. I mean, I am forever associated with that character, which was another reason, you know, why when I got these characters, I said, you know, I, I have to find the ground where I can do this to a expand my audience, but also make the longtime fans happy. You know that they're finally getting resolution you know with regards to the these characters that they grew up with so so you know to me it's not just a matter of keeping up with sonic and knuckles there's this whole world up there of, of these characters and set up here that people have followed for years and, and that new readers are being introduced to through the archie reprints so, you know, you know, the perspective I have is a lot different than what you guys may imagine. Uh, but, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, you got, I, I don't know, I don't know if you were joking, but, uh, you kind of, I saw a tweet that said that you are the savior of the red guys. <laughs> Were you joking or is it just? <laughs> Let me put it this way. That was very much uh, 
tongue in cheek on, on my end, but that, but the thing is, you know, for me to say something like that, yes, I, I, I get the, how egotistical it sounds and everything like that. I, I, I do. I, I, you know, and, but this is not me. This is, I can't begin to tell you how many other people, you know, and I'm talking fellow professionals or, or people in the, the industry in various capacities, you know, and that includes even outside the comics industry. I'm talking about for animation where basically they looked at me, you know, as the primary creator during this long stretch of time. Okay. And if you look at the history of licensed comic books, for example, okay, there's only a handful of properties, okay, that have lasted as long as or even longer than Sonic. Um, I believe Conan lasted like 275 issues, which the series is going to be taking, you know, overtaking very shortly. Um, yeah. G.I. Joe, I think, only ran for like 155, 156 issues. Uh, Tarzan, again, I think, I think that's another 250 issue or something like that. Um, even Star Wars and Star Trek, uh, they've never made it uh, long at any publisher up until a certain point. I mean, I know Dark Horse, they've, they've done a run of books for like the past 15 years or something like that since Phantom Menace came out. But up until that point, Star Wars uh, really... It was only like 107, 108 books, that kind of thing. So uh, there really wasn't much as far as licensed comics go. And if you look at the track record of any comics based on video games, for example, Valiant did a, uh, a line of Nintendo comics, including Super Mario Brothers and... and uh, uh, Le yeah, Legend of Zelda, which I also worked on. Really? Okay. Yes, I did uh, issue three. I did some material for that. So, yes. Um, and if you look at, for example, Mike Gallagher and Dave Manick, who were the original writer and artist of uh, the Sonic series. Well, Dave came in after Scott Shaw, so I, I need to acknowledge that. Uh, they worked on the 50 issues of ALF for Marvel's uh, licensed books. But the thing is, once ALF went off the air, okay... Uh, the book sales died. There was nothing there to support it, okay? And so, around the time issue 36, I, again, I was working on issue 36, and editor Scott Fulp called me up and he said that the cartoons were canceled, you know, the weekday and the Saturday morning, so there's not going to be any more of that, and that Archie fully expected the book to die within the next six to eight months because that was the trajectory of sales of a licensed book once the main focus went away because the games were only just sporadic and, and if the games were like a who knows when those things were going to be released you know the you know Archie was always ready and very few people know this you know especially even as when i was uh up to about issue 150 archie was always quick that they were ready to pull the plug on the book anytime at the first sign of set dropping sales so once the cartoons went off the air um it, it was really funny that in essence because of our stories you know um, and it was particularly Endgame that really started uh, uh, the whole thing forward. That's when the sales really started uh, going forward. I mean, improving. And and the funny thing was, I was happy just working on Knuckles once I finished Sonic Super Special Two. But what happened was because my name was not associated with issues 51 and 52, okay, 
uh, Archie noticed a drop in sales, you know, because in, in the diamond catalog, you know, uh, here, my name's not associated with, uh, with the book, but it is with Knuckles. And when they got the lower orders from the comic shops, that's when I got a phone call from Justin saying, you know, can you do some backup stories in the book so we can at least have your name on the Sonic comic when we solicit orders for the thing. So, believe me, this the, this bit that I'm the savior of the Sonic comic, that did not originate with me, but I... You know, this is this has been my experience. Okay, and I apologize for asking that. No, no, it's it's fine. Um, the the one thing I, I do want to clarify, though, if I may, when you ask the what do I prefer, writing or drawing? You know, you know, I I prefer the act, act of creation. I, I I get the the idea in my head, whether it's a story, whether it's art, whether it's film. Okay, and. Once I get the idea, and once I see the finished product, you know, I, and I have accomplished what I've set out to do, to me, that's the most satisfaction. It's in between figuring out how to get from A to B, that's always the hard part. And it's not that I don't enjoy any of it. As a matter of fact, I must be a glutton for punishment, but it's just... The act of creation is never that easy and because I'm always looking for, you know, the best I can do and only the final results will determine whether or not I end up happy with the, with the work or not. So that's that's where I am. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I guess my last question will be, what was the inspiration for the Lost Ones? Inspiration for the Lost Ones? Um... Very much, I was interested in doing a group of superheroes who are not white Anglo Saxon Protestant, essentially. I also thought, and this was really weird, but I thought that there were, wasn't really a, a well done female character in comics at the time. Um, and I wanted to explore a different culture at the same time. You know, and I was very fascinated with the Japanese culture. So I thought, you know, this would allow me to explore all those interests uh, at the same time. Plus my love of science fiction. Okay. Well, um, I'll ask this question. And as um, out of the characters that you own, uh, which one is your favorite? Which one is my favorite? Yeah, I would have to say Laura Sue because I don't know where she's going to end up. Okay. All right, and um, my last question is: How do you feel about the fan fan reception that the Laura Sue Chronicles is get, getting so with all the teasers that we've shown lately? You see, I, I know what you're getting at, and 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 I know I've said this elsewhere, you know. But the thing is, what people see online isn't the full uh, exposure to what I get because I don't just see what's online. I also see, um, I also interact with a lot of the fans in person when I do comic book conventions. I also receive email from them. I and and it's not just America. I I receive email uh, from around the globe. I am constantly getting requests for uh, sales of back issue and original artwork. And again, those are coming from all over the globe. So I've been reading to put it uh, in perspective. I like to follow a lot of political uh, websites, and you can easily uh, find a lot more negative, no matter what the topic, than positive. And as soon as somebody says oh, something yeah. positive on anything, 
And it, do, it, is, it doesn't have to be me. It could be any subject whatsoever. All of a sudden, the person that has, has said the positive, you know, you can see the immediate negative backlash to the positive. Like, how could you say that? You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, from what I see, a lot of people tend to not want to get sucked up into the negativity because it can get quite a bit negative and uh and they've got better things to do with than just argue and feel like they have to defend that which they like you know um i certainly don't like to feel like i have to defend you know no matter what it is um whether you know i like a, a certain comic book title or a certain artist or anything like that i may enjoy it but i recognize other people may not like it and i, I really don't have the time to go and debate you know whether the good points or, or bad points about that so um i just take the comments i i i, I hear them i i read them but the thing is uh, I also have the I also am the recipient of a lot of the positive as well in other ways. Um, that that is what helps keep it in perspective for me. All right. Okay. Well, I'll ask my uh, last questions. So, uh, but my okay. my last question to you, sir, is um, what does the future hold for you? What does the future hold for me? Wow. Um, right now, my immediate future is is immediately getting this Jeffrey Remington story done. Then it's the Loris Two Chronicles, and somewhere along the line, um, you know, the Republic and the Lost Ones are falling in there. You know, as far as professional, um, as far as everything else, like right now, I'm dealing with a. You know, I'm looking forward to my son getting married later this year, so that's a pretty happy event. Oh, and congratulations, uh, congratulations, man! Oh, well, thank you. Um, and uh, you know, as a matter of fact, once he graduates college, come May, we'll have gotten all three of our kids through uh, through college. So you know, we'll, Bernie and I will feel like uh, we, you know cross the major threshold at that point. And, You've completed uh, Act 2. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, there, there's a lot. We look at the future as something optimistic, really. Um, uh, if something new or interesting pops up along the way, uh, we'll deal with it as it comes. But right now, I know, I know where my focus is, and I and basically, as far as Laura Sue Chronicles go, I find that has a seven book series, no more, no less. Uh, I look at that more or less as my retirement plan. So, there. Oh, That's okay. okay. All right. Uh, do you have okay. time for fan questions? What? Do you have time for fan questions? Sure, I have time for fan questions. All right, Kyle, you hit the first one. Okay, uh, the first one, I believe, is from a... Disannoyed. I do apologize if I pronounce his name wrong or her. No, no. Um, it was regarding uh, the Laura Sue Chronicles, the Praetorian specifically. Um, does he have a name? I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> the Praetorian. Yes. Oh, cool. I got it. <laughs> he has a name, and it'll, it'll be shared within one of the volumes. That's all I'll say on that subject. Okay. You hear that, Disannoyed? <laughs> If that's how your name is pronounced. <laughs> All right. Uh, the tenth Doctor asks, "Did you have any plans for Doctor Finitivus?" Doctor Finitivus is not my character. That's Carl's character. He introduced that, I believe, that character in the Return to Angel Island storyline. I think in Sonic One Thirty Nine through One Forty One or something like that. Um, so, I have nothing to say or do with that character so i can't comment one way or the other all right um here's the last one although i feel a bit uncomfortable asking it's from sonic blue ranger if I... yeah it's okay. go ahead guys yeah 
if hypothetically you, Archie and Sega, came to a deal to have your characters brought into new content into the new continuity, but under the guideline that you and Ian Flynn had to co-write a story that put Lara Sue Chronicles in an undeniable un- alternate future, would you? Uh, first off, I think. Archie, Sagan, and I would have to come to an agreement where all three of us could be happy first before anything would happen. So, I mean, to put specific uh, guidelines in there before anything were worked out, I think it's kind of like putting the cart before the horse. Um, I... Let's put it this way. I, I don't think anything would happen unless all three parties uh, were happy with the arrangement one way or the other. Okay? And it, what it comes down to more than anything. And this is and, and, and this is what people need to understand more than anything. It, 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 because it's not personal. Okay? Archie and Sega are both companies that exist to make money. Okay? And if they thought, for example... They could make a lot more money in, by incorporating uh, Lara Sue Chronicles uh, chronology into their thing, whether as a video game or, or the comic books. Um, they would do it, okay? But it takes somebody to believe that this is this is what's going to help their bottom line, okay? And unless you have somebody who believes that it's going to help the bottom line, you know, uh, I think that's. I think that's the question that fans uh, should be asking themselves is whether or not they think that, you know, if, you know, Archie, Sega, and I, we were to announce, you know, uh, any given time that, hey, we we set aside all our differences and we're going to put something together, you know, whether or not that would attract the attention. Because, I mean... Look what happened when Sony and Marvel announced, you know, they're doing Spider-Man together. You know, they're making it work. Sony's going to be able to do their Spider-Man movies. Marvel's going to get to use the character, you know, in their movies. Okay? And the fans were overjoyed, you know. You know, peace in our time. So, you know, who's to say that, you know, there wouldn't be you know, similar reaction, smaller scale because of the size of the audience, you know, if this were to occur and who's to say that it might not take off if it were to occur, you know? So I don't say no to anything until somebody, it all starts with people talking. Okay. And, um, it it does me no good to say, I'm not going to talk to anyone because, you know, that's not how you get things accomplished. Okay. All right. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it. That's, yeah. that's, it. that's all. Yes. Thank you. For, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Prince, for accepting for the interview. Up. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, guys, if you could at least send me a link to wherever you post this, so I could at least, you know, check out and see how sure it. Sure thing. Out. Okay. Oh, of course. Yeah. I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, no okay. Problem, okay. Else, yeah. You have a nice okay. day. You too, guys. Take care.